Uh, well, we're in uh, <clears throat> Genesis 17, and we are getting very, very close to finishing this up. Um, but tonight, <clears throat> I want to do something a little different. Uh, what I would like to do, so I need you to pay attention to this because it's going to be a little different. I want to read two uh, chapters. I want to read um, Genesis 17 which we've been in, and we're getting close to the end. I may not even read all of it, but I want to read it, a certain portion of it. And then I want to read Romans 4. And in doing that, what I would like for you to do, which means it will require for you to pay attention. Uh, you, can, you can follow along if you have your Bible also. Pay attention to... Um, as we read specific words and concepts that are going on in uh, Genesis 17, and then notice where that's being touched upon in Romans 4. Romans 4 is uh, basically a combination of Genesis 15 and Genesis 17. The Genesis 15 part, if you will remember, the Genesis 15 part is the part where um, <clears throat> Abraham, or Abram at the time, didn't have his name changed. Uh, uh, he was not a father of many nations yet, no name change. But he uh, was doubting, and he, was, uh, he asked God, well, how shall I know that you're going you're gonna to do this with your seed? And the subject was the seed. The subject was the seed. It wasn't, it wasn't the land or any of that stuff. It was the seed, and it was the seed that was going to make him a father. Well, so he's, he's going through some hard times. So God, God uh, first takes him over to the altar and shows him a sacrifice, just like the prodigal son's father showed him the sacrifice and said, this is us, this is it, this is how, this is the only way I'm going to bring this about is going to be through an offering, a sacrifice. And then he took him out and he showed him the stars of heaven and he said, so shall thy seed be. And the Bible says that he believed, that Abram believed God. He didn't believe the stars, he believed God about what he was saying about the seed, not many seeds, but the seed. And what we find um, in uh, the New Testament, and you know, Paul particularly talks about that in uh, Galatians 3.16, where he describes that seed as Christ, and it is Christ in us. And that's the life of Christ, not just that we get saved and we have Christ in us, but that we have the life of Christ and that he's able to live and manifest and move. Uh, and so, um, so Romans 4 is a combination of that example I just gave you out of Genesis 15 and, uh, and then what we're going to read and what we've already read in Genesis 17. And it's interesting how it just brings it in, in Romans 4 uh, together like that. And what it tells us is that in God's mind, the Bible really is one book with one main message. And uh, it also tells us that in our mind, our little Christian minds, we pick a chapter or maybe just a verse and we study that and we're never really able to see it in the grander view of how it all fits together. Well, there's a guy that does do that and his name's Paul and, um, and he's presenting um, much in this process of Abraham uh, in relationship to the seed and faith for the seed. Well, faith for the seed means that he's going to become a father and ultimately a father of many so that the stars in that sense do represent Christ in many, but it is not, again, 
believing that I'm going to be a father. It's believing that I'm going to have the seed and that seed is going to, to, to spill out, as it were, uh, in, a, in a multitude. Um, so let's, uh, let's let me read parts, uh, and I'll, I'll clue you where, but we're going to start with Genesis 17, 1. And right at first, we'll go down to verse 11. Um, here we go. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to him and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. Okay, so that be thou perfect is, again, we talked about it's not being sinless, and Romans is going to point out that that being perfect is having the right faith for the seed. Okay, <clears throat> um, and I will make my covenant, notice this is the import, one important part, between me and thee, and multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. So this, uh, this covenant that he's making, um, when, excuse me, when we get into Romans, um, He's referring that covenant to the promised seed and, and to faith, faith that he's going to have that, okay? Um, verse 7, And I will establish my covenant between thee, uh, me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. So this is ongoing, the life of Christ being put in others, uh, through generations um, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Now, you notice how he keeps mentioning the seed, the seed, the seed. Verse 8, And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And, and God uh, said unto Abram, Abraham, uh, thou shalt keep my covenant, again covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every child among you shall be circumcised and ye shall, um, ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a token of the covenant between you and me. Okay. So the next couple of verses talk about, you know, the, the lay of the land in relationship to the, the circumcision uh, in relationship to his family and servants and this sort of thing. Then verse 15, <clears throat> um, he picks it up in relationship to Sarah. And what is he talking about in relationship to Sarah? The seed. Again, the seed, the seed. This is, this is Abraham and her, and they're going to bring forth the seed. Galatians 3, 16, And he saith, Not unto seeds as of many, but unto thy seed, which is Christ. So this is all a reference to us through a certain kind of faith bringing forth the life and nature of Christ. Okay. So, um, and God said unto Abraham, As for Sarah thy wife, thou shalt not call her Sarai, uh, but Sarah shall be her name, and I will bless her. Mm, remember, we talked about this. You know, when, God, when we hear in churches today, I will bless, you know, Thus saith the Lord, I will bless you. We automatically think of cars or money or a better job and all this stuff. But not the Lord. When he, what he considers blessing you is putting that seed in you and bringing him forth. And so the, the, he's going to come forth. I will bless you and you'll bring forth that seed. You'll bring it forth. Okay. 
uh, I will bless her and give, and there it is, I will bless her and give thee a son also of her, and I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, kings and people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. Uh, one of the things I'm uh, taken with here is in verse 17 is the first time anyone laughs, and it's Abra Abraham, and he laughs in 17. And um, uh, and then it's in uh, verse 19, God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Laugh. He laughed. It didn't take God long to pick up on, okay, because um, Isaac means he laughs. And I will establish my covenant with him, the seed, for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. <clears throat> and, and as for Ishmael, I have heard thee, behold, I have blessed him. <clears throat> and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But, but, my covenant, my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. All right. <clears throat> now we're going to go to Romans 4, if you'll turn there with me, please. And... Um, <clears throat> We're going to read all of Romans 4. So, what you have to do now is prepare your heart and your mind to focus on the wording of Romans 4 because it's Paul giving the explanation in part. I mean, he spends, in truth, you know, Paul constantly in different books and, you know, uh, that he wrote refers to Abraham, and uh, particularly in Galatians. But this has given us the part of the story in relationship to what was going on in Genesis 15 and what's going on in Genesis 17. <clears throat> so here we go. Romans 4, verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh hath found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. All right, so uh, Abraham's fretting early on about where's the seed, and I want, to, I want the seed, and you know, uh, it's good you're gonna bless me, and it's good that you're doing all this stuff, but you know, I want the seed. <clears throat> this can be very much like us who get saved and then somebody comes along and starts talking about the seed being formed in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And we hear of his nature and we hear of the way that he is and we go, I don't just want to be a Christian. I want him formed in me. I want him formed in me. And so, and you know, like, like he was formed in Sarah and like Abraham's seed came forth out of her. And so, so with time, we're starting to not see, not seeing a big manifestation. We're not really seeing the seed come forth. Um, and uh, we begin to fret and we begin to worry and we begin to wonder, you know, well, you know, kind of like Abraham did because he was fretting and worrying in, ch in the beginning of chapter 15. And... Um, uh, and, and, he, uh, and so the person begins to do that and just wonder and maybe even start to doubt some, well, I don't know what's wrong with me or, you know, whatever, however we go with it. Or maybe God just didn't like me or something. And um, so that's what this has to do with here. Uh, it says, uh, what shall we say then that Abraham, our father, uh, meaning the father of the first one to have brought forth the seed, 
can we learn from him? Because he did it even though he went through stuff and wondered and doubted at times. Okay. What shall, what shall we say then that Abraham our father hath, uh, as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. Okay, so he's um, he is uh, old. Uh, Sarah is old. Uh, God could have appeared to Abraham when he was uh, like 21. You know, appeared to him when you're 21 and you're going to do this and you know that. But see, God doesn't do that. God really waits till we, you know, pretty much run out of all of our brilliant ideas and all of our hopes and dreams of great ministry because it's going to be Christ now or whatever. However we perceive with our minds based on our wishes, our three wishes, or seven or 50, uh, of what this all means. So it's saying, well, what, is, what did Abraham find in relationship to all of this? Well, he, that he had nothing to boast about, nothing to glory in, because he, God, waited till he couldn't bring it forth and then brought it forth so that there's no doubt. <clears throat> All right. So, for what saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Okay, well, here's going to be one of the beautiful things of Romans 4. One of the beautiful things of Romans 4 is God is not going to bring up, or Paul doesn't bring up, and God doesn't, bring up all the failures. <clears throat> he acts like when he finally brings forth the seed, all he remembers is the seed that came forth and not any of the flesh. Well, that's good. You know, that's real good. All right, so... What saith the scripture? Abraham, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that works, okay, so in, in um, Genesis 15 and in Genesis 17, in both places, God particularly confirms that you are going to have this seed. And in uh, Genesis 15, he believed God, and he did. He, he believed that God was going to do this, uh, and that belief wasn't that it had come forth yet, that the seed, that Christ, that Christ crucified, that the Lamb, however you want to put it, but that God was going to do it. He believed God. Okay? All right. So you say, well, what about all this stuff we just read about? Well, we'll deal with that somewhat, <clears throat> a little bit. Uh, for what saith the Scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Okay? So if you had of every ounce that Abraham worked to bring this about, such as... Um, uh, taken up with Lot and assuming that Lot in the first couple of uh, chapters in Genesis that deal with Abraham's beginnings, chapter 11 and 12 um, and 13, God had to plainly show him, this is not my firstborn. Look at him. This is not, you know, he has nothing of that. And so Abraham, you know, went with God on that. But then we come, that's in 13. Then in 15 again, uh, Eliezer is brought up. Uh, but he's not pleased with that either. But he's still flailing. <clears throat> okay. Counted to him, now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. What is the ungodly? 
The ungodly is those who don't believe in the seed. They believe they're, they're good enough, they're smart enough, they're spiritual enough, they're full enough. They've, they've got it together and, you know, and, and I, either, either I'm the seed, which they're not, or, or uh, I uh, have the seed, which they may not because they're doing it by works. It's a, they, they do have the seed, but it's Ishmael. Or I will get the seed. Well, okay. That last one is okay, but not in a spirit of, like, because I deserve it. But because of the Lord and His heart for His Son, not for His heart for us, in, the, in that, you know, I'll give it to you because you're special to me. No, none of that. But rather, I want my Son, and if I can get you in the right place, I'll bring Him forth. I don't have a problem with doing that. All right. So, uh, verse 5, But to him that worketh but uh, not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay, so, so in Genesis 15, he has a faith that's counted for righteousness, but one day he's going to have the seed which is made unto him righteousness. Right now he's believing for the seed, not salvation, but the seed. Because remember, this is Genesis. Check the, check the context. It's the coming forth of the promised seed that God is after. All right. And Paul says plenty of that throughout the book of Romans. Um, then... Um, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness. Okay, he's introducing a word here that he's going to use four times, maybe more, four times in this section. And it is the word blessed or blessedness. And... Um, it is a word that was used in Genesis 17 when God spoke of Sarah and said, I will bless her. In other words, she's going to bring forth the seed. The blessedness that he's talking about here is that, you know, good. You're in, if you're in Genesis 15, you know, then, you know, you have a faith that's counted to you for righteousness, but it's not the seed yet. He hadn't come forth. You're not a father of anything. You know, and you could see that with Abraham. You go, well, he's not a father of anything, so what's the big deal? And he wants the seed. Um, so, but when it moves over to 17, it's getting ready to set this thing in motion. And you notice when I read Genesis 17, so much emphasis on the seed and, and coming generations and everlasting covenant. And this thing is bigger than you, buddy. And it's going to happen that many people are going to want to bring forth the seed. All right. So um, David sa describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered, because everything that you believed up to that point was that it was about you, but now you're believing in the seed, and you're believing that that's where God's um, favor, grace, rests. And so all that's counted to you, whether you manifest it right now or not. Well, that should be good news. I mean, you're going, if you're one of those that's going, like Abraham did in the, the first part of uh, 15, and says, that's great. You are my exceedingly great reward. Thank you for giving me the victory. Thank you for giving me all this spoils, but I want the seed. If you're one of those people, then you're not satisfied right now even though everything's covered um, and he's counted to you for that.
but it's not him yet. Then, we need to keep going then, okay? Um, saying, blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And then verse 9, and, um, cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. So now he's beginning to, to try to make something clear. Uh, what is he talking about absolutely beginning with verse 9? Well, he's talking about Genesis 17 because it's the first time circumcision got brought up. Okay? And he's, uh, he's using circumcision as another step, as it were, to show that this is a token in your flesh for me that you're going to bring forth the seed. All right, so let me read it. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? Okay, so the question is, uh, now we're not, if we step right, uh, we've been talking about all this up to this point, if we step right over that line now from Genesis 15 to Genesis 17, then we start thinking not like um, the, uh, the seed is counted to me for righteousness. My faith, my faith that the seed's going to come forth. Because that, that, that was Abraham's faith. He wasn't saying, I believe that there's a Savior going to come and die on a cross and I won't go to hell. That wasn't his faith. His faith was... God promised me a seed and he showed me this and he showed me the altar and based on that I'm going to believe you since I got nothing in me to offer. Okay, So that's real good. We do good up to that point. But now it gets to circumcision we get a little confused. So Paul wants to straighten that out and he starts talking about Abraham or he starts talking about uncircumcised and circumcised. And we go, oh, well, I have to be circumcised. I have to be circumcised. I have to, all of that. Okay, yes, but in, in the full scope. See, circumcision in the context of Genesis is still not the coming forth of the seed. He hadn't come forth. He didn't come forth till later. We want the seed. We don't want our faith countered to us for righteousness to, to deceive us into thinking, well, that's the seed. No, we don't want uh, the topic of circumcision to deceive us saying, oh, well, I've been circumcised, so that's the seed. No, it's not. It's still him uh, just as clearly in 15 when the seed got brought up, he went and showed an altar. Just as clearly in Genesis 17, when Abram was wanting the seed, he showed circumcision. And he's saying, this, you won't know the seed until there's an altar. Anybody read uh, like Genesis 22? Because that's really, I'll just say this now. That's really when he became the seed. Isaac was not the seed until there was an altar. And that all was done correctly according to the father's heart pertaining to his son in that son and that altar. So we, we go, well, he's finally here. You know, we we'll see if we get all excited about the righteousness thing in 15. Then we get all excited that, well, I'm circumcised in 17. And then we get all excited over here in, what is it, 19, uh, where he finally comes forth. But none of those are the coming forth of the seed that God wants until Genesis 22, where it is tested in the earth. An altar. The giving, the given son, the altered son, I've, I've called it before. So, um, we, have to, we have to stay with Genesis 
all the way through till God's finished with Abraham and the story and all that because he got what he wanted. That's the same with us. We have to stay with this process all the way through until he gets his altered son, until he gets that crucified son out of us. Um, and not camp along the way and decide to live there. You know, and say, I've got it, I've got it. Um, okay, so I can hear somebody saying, well, I've been so frustrated and I've been wanting, the, I've been wanting Christ to come forth more in me, but you know, da 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 da. And, and you know, it gives me hope when we talk about counted to me for righteousness. Well, good, it should, but hope is not Him. You're hoping in Him. Well, you know, when you talk about circumcision, and I feel like, you know, maybe, maybe there's a, a certain amount of truth that the cross has been really added to me. It's not just me being a free will Christian that's just, you know, uh, crossless, if you will. Um, good, that's fine. That's a, that's a step. But that circumcision is not the sun coming forth at the cross. It's not the yet. It's not yet. That's got to be in the flesh. That's got to manifest. And it's got to be the sun manifesting, not us getting circumcised and then calling that and the man. That's a token of it. The very word token means it hadn't come yet. The real thing hadn't come. I, and this is God talking. The real thing hadn't come, and I'm looking, I'm still looking for it. Okay. Well, don't get discouraged if you've made, you know, the trek up to that to to Genesis 17. Be with the Lord in this, but know that everybody, everybody that really has the Lamb manifested in them, that that has the real seed coming forth to the altar through them, everybody has had to go through this same process. It's not a shorter version for some. It's the same process. And it's, and, um, and it's not, you know, all that we put in our head along the way, and I think that's where the biggest um, stumbling block is, um, because instead of us having those experiences, we learn certain things about the Lord and we're going through a process of learning a bunch of things that is, you know, the end of this can't be a bunch of knowledge on an altar or our doctrines of the depths of, of the cross and the depths of all of this. It can't be that. It cannot be that. It has to be the Father getting his real son in manifestation through death, selfless giving in us before he's going to be satisfied. Okay, so uh, do, don't you kind of think that Abraham in going through this process had ups and downs and had some discouragements and had some wanderings or doubts or whatever and all this? Well, yeah, we, we have proofs of that. Uh, but we need to have the faith of Abraham. The faith of Abraham that holds on to the heart of the Father that wants, that wants more than you to give you the seed, to have him come forth. But he has to cut some flesh off. That's what the circumcision represents. It doesn't represent the coming forth of Christ so much in that sense as in the scope of the larger picture as much as it represents there's some, there's some flesh that needs to be cut off of you. There's still some flesh that needs to be cut off. Well, that's pretty evident because God brought up circumcision and the first thing when, God, when uh, Abraham finally gets to talk, he goes, oh, that Ishmael may live before you. And God's just going to see See, that's why, you know, that's why I'm still dealing with you until the bringing forth, the coming, the coming of the Lord, the bringing forth of the seed, 
the, the joy, the, the, the son of the father's love. How do, we, how do we even have a clue of the depth? Why would there be a scripture in the Bible that talks that way about the father-son relationship if there wasn't this incredible love the father has and not just toward his son sitting beside him in heaven before the foundation of the world or walking the shores of Galilee for three and a half years, but the given son on the cross, the altered son. That's when he said, that's this, you know, that this, this is the fulfillment of this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased because this is where, this is where the beloved son proves that he's the firstborn, the beloved. Same with, with Isaac. Take now thy son, thine only son, thy son that, whom thou lovest, your beloved son, your only son, your only begotten son, your only son, and offer him up, and we'll see how this thing goes. Well, you know, that's Abraham's faith, and that's where we need to be. We need to, you know, is, is that enough no, well, again, I'm sorry if I'm circling back around, but I'm trying to keep us in the corral, <laughs> um, is that eventually it's not just a hope, it's not just a faith, it is a manifestation of the living Christ and, and the giving, given Christ, the, the slaughtered lamb. So, all right. Um, so he's talking about that. He's talking about the, the promise, and he's talking about the faith, starting in verse 16. Um, well, let's see. Let's go ahead and look at verse 12. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but also who walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. Okay? So he already believed before he was circumcised. And that was counted to him for righteousness to move him on, on in this thing. Verse 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world, meaning that all this seed is going to not just come forth out of him. I mean, what a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing if, if we could grasp that if we really went through this process, we, we had the faith of Abraham and we counted to us for righteousness, and we went through the circumcision part to get rid of the Ishmael idea, uh, and, and finally got the son and didn't anoint him as the firstborn yet until he became the beloved son, which is always a reference to death. Uh, uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have that process go through us? Step by step, who, let's see, let's see, walk in the steps of the faith of our father, Abraham, which he had been yet uncircumcised, and go through that until the seed comes forth in us. And then, somehow, because that seed that came forth, that was not us, but it was the life within us touched other people and it moved to another generation. And then it moved on from because they got it. And then it moved on to another generation and to another generation. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Praise God instead of just, well, we lived and we died. And that's the end of it. But somehow there's an impartation. There's a there's a uh, continuation. There's a perpetual sacrifice. The morning and the evening, the continual sacrifice going on for generations on down. Well, uh, the, the heir of the world is talking about that was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And if they uh, and if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void. But the promise 
made of non-effect. So he's still dealing with the covenant of circumcision and the promise. Um, because the law worketh wrath, for there were, where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, to the end, the promise might be made sure to all the seed. We're not the seed, but all of us bear that. We can bear that seed. Um, and and it can, he can fall into our ground and die and bring forth fruit of his nature. Uh, and, and not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who's the father of us all. So he's saying, you know, I'm talking to you guys, Gentiles, you guys, Romans, that you are included in this if, it, if you allow the seed to come forth. Uh, that only which of the law, but the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. So he's saying what he's saying this, what I am telling you, Romans, I'm saying this was written down. And it says that God said to him, I have made thee a father of many nations when he wasn't one yet, before whom he believed. That's what we're working on. A belief right now that God is going to do what he promised. It's, we're that, you know, if we're stumbling with that, we're really going to have a hard time down the road. But Abraham stumbled at it too. But God's honoring the faith that he did have when he came back around. And we see that down here. Uh, verse... Uh, well, 17 again, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead. This is it. See, not a God who does a miracle or, uh, and makes, a, makes a, a, um, a barren woman give birth. You're on the wrong track. I'm on the wrong track. We're on the wrong track. If we're looking at it like a miracle, and we're looking for a miracle for God to bring forth something. It's not a miracle we're looking for. It's, it's a quickening of the dead. And we're that. We're that so that we can bring forth Christ. It's a travail. All right. Um, uh, Verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither the, yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Okay, so what do you think about those words right there? This is clearly talking about <laughs> Genesis 17, um, uh, that uh, being not in weak in faith, he considered not his own body nor the deadness that when he was a hundred. That's exactly the time period of Genesis 17. Well, he did consider his body, his body, and he laughed. And he did consider and say, well, can, can a 90-year-old woman bear? You know, oh, that I, uh, Ishmael might live before you. But it's not written here. Because once you pass that, that, port, that place, and you're moving on toward what the Lord has, that's erased. That's erased. You know, we may not even understand this, but instead of it all just being about forgiving our daily sins as we lie and we cheat and we do this and we, you know, exalt ourselves and we do all this kind of stuff, what if also included in that is that He totally forgives all of our doubts and unbeliefs and it's not even written into the story because Christ is there and that's all he wants and he loves it and it's like a father running to his son and embracing him and old things are passed away behold all things have become new so listen to the next one 
He staggered not at the promise of God. I mean, either the Bible is lying, contradicting, or, and I learned not to say the Bible contradicts itself, uh, or it really is true that the former things will not be remembered anymore. Your life, your Christian life, your failures of trying to do this or, or, or making it about works or this or that, they're not even remembered anymore. It's like a woman in travail. All of the pain, all of the junk, it's not even mentioned anymore. You don't think about it as much as you just the joy that the Son has come forth. So he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded. I mean, the, the wording here is just like, wow. Clearly, you can get to a place where the seed starts coming forth. And God just overshadows, overshadows everything but his son. And it's, it's like blotted out. It's like blotting out that portion of the sun that never, it'll never shine on that again because he's received his son. Um, being, uh, verse 21, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also... Uh, he was able also to perform, verse 22, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone, but it, that it was imputed to him alone. Let me reread 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him. Okay, the thing that I want to want to close with, and that is just looking at the verses here, um, this it has been mentioning um, the, the promise. It's been mentioning circumcision. It's been mentioning all these things at this latter part that um, uh, are pushed together in chapter 17 with chapter 15. And God sees it as a whole. He sees it as a continuing reality and he intermingles it to show that the things that are going on here have effect here. And the things that are going on here in 17 have an effect over here in 15. And as you look at the greater picture, you see the greater picture. You don't just see one little thing over here in 15 and then hold on to that the rest of your life, you see that the Father is progressively committed to His Son. And you see that when it gets to the end, as it were, um, um, that Abraham, like the Heavenly Father Himself, Abraham is committed to the firstborn being given. The father, Abraham, is like the father above, and he's committed to giving his son because his son is given. And he doesn't hold him back for himself. I mean, this is, some of you may remember, this has been a long time ago because we've been on the firstborn for such a long time. But one of the things we realized uh, when, uh, when the firstborn came out of Egypt, we know that they were meant to be given. But one of the reasons why the firstborn wasn't given and God had to revert to animal sacrifices was because of the parents. They held their kids back from being firstborns from being giving and given in that way. <clears throat> well, we'll see when we get to Genesis 22 that God is just overwhelmed with the, the faith and the heart of Abraham that has gotten this thing, that has realized it, that has come into it. And I need to stop. I'm sorry. I wasn't watching the clock too well. Realized it in a human being that is now one with him in heart and mind and one with him in how he manifests his life relations 
with God in the earth through that son. Okay. So we'll quit. Father, we just bless you and we we love your heart and we we may not we may be so earthly down here that we don't understand a God who would spare not his own son. But if we would learn you and we would know you, whether we like you or not, we would at least see that this is an integral part of you in relationship to your son and an integral part of your son in relationship to you. It is an ongoing nature that flows between you and including the Holy Spirit. And Father, that uh, yes, our minds and our flesh and our carnality keep us from fully grasping these things. But for those that sense something of you in these things, those whom the Spirit of God is able to start that, that tickling our heart to move in, in these directions, we will find you wonderful. And we will find Jesus, the, the slaughtered lamb. We will find him the most beautiful thing that ever walked the face of the earth. And that you allowed him to walk the face of this earth. And, and you allowed him to manifest who God was in nature. Help us, Holy Spirit. Help us, Father. That your son may, may be, uh, that, that you may receive the son of your love through these earthen vessels that are now on this earth and will be gone soon and we will be other people's turn. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.